ein Tuch. Ein high fast would be the replacement of the capacitor by the coil. present to your mind when listening that every pop music acoustic signal is handled by this kind of filters and by much many more more complex systems which analog in the in the 60s by analog devices nowadays by digital devices there's no 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 sound without filtering and and, and uh, mathematical processing when, when George Martin as a, as a producer of Search and Pepper uh, yeah. has boom once and for all. There's no original sound by no Beatle since 67. What I forget to say when speaking about the electrification of musical instruments, I dare say that this in, uh, electrification is tantamount to the difference between jazz music and pop music. Jazz, jazz is taken down by electronic means on records and CDs, but um, on the production side, in classical jazz, let's say, there are no electrical tricks and devices in, implied. And pop music, as, as I just said, lives from its um, electrical post processing. Also, one step and say that jazz before World War II uh, was uh, was low frequency jazz, Lester Young, for instance, uh, intended to be transmitted by amplitude by AM by amplitude modula modulated radio stations and jazz since Charlie Parker would be high frequency FM uh, signaling of music bebop. And f uh, frequency modu modulation is one of the big driving forces of, of World War II. In opposition to civil radio, commercial radio, uh, military radio, always has contents, no need to search them elsewhere. And fre frequency modulated radar and uh, frequency modulated uh, radio, single military radio, and high frequency optical pro processing of signals are at the outbreak, at the, are the preconditions of World War II. 
a young and simple mind, simple-minded uh, German engineer had defined in 1884 how to change uh, pictures, images into one-dimensional dim data flows. That is to bring down the two-dimensional picture to a sequences of dots with different black or white energy. So he, in principle, this NIPCO had uh, given the way to black-white uh, television systems, TV systems, but uh, in, uh, this, and this was a mechanical proposal and proved unfeasible uh, under these very high frequency conditions of, of TV as electronical or sorry, electrical continuation of the old uh, mechanical medium called film. In order to transmit by wireless uh, images in real time, that is very for the eyes in real time, for the eyes and for the moved objects in the film, uh, incredibly high frequencies came into play at the end of the 20s and early 30s. And the electronics became more and more complicated. America concentrated uh, on the uh, on the side of the sender, and Germany on the side of the receiver, TV receiver. I mean, and given friendly relations before. Uh, Pearl Harbor, let's say, <laughs> or from the uh, invasion of France. Um, the exiled Russian Zvorikin of, from RCA, Radio Corporation of America, and, and Nazi engineer, Nazi engineer, uh, Manfred von Arbenne, exchanged their equipment and Olympia. Uh, 1936 in Berlin became feasible as the first television event. You see the iconoscope imported from, from RCA, took the pictures and uh, von Ardennes uh, monitor uh, re reconstructed the big, big, uh, moving park picture for the for the population. And also Marconi himself had experiences, ex made exper experiments with high frequency uh, radio and frequency modulation, FM. He and everybody in physics resigned under the illusion that high frequency FM could be transmitted only when no physical or geographical hindrance mountains or hills, they're, they're blocking the communication line between sender and emitter and, and receiver. But uh, General Heinz Guderian, tank chief of the German Wehrmacht, looked out desperately to, for means how to communicate between, from, from tank to tank, intercom uh, for, uh, between a, a tank company Panzer Company or pa Panzer Re Regiment or Panzer Division and so on. And, and then he sent his uh, engineers into, a, into their hearts uh, 
the middle mount, mountainous region of Germany, and it proved that FM could uh, could surround uh, hills and sm smaller smaller mountains, and the tanks in 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 mountainous uh, enemy landscapes could continue to communicate between each other. This was in 34, and in, in the one and only Blitzkrieg ever, ever waged, uh, Germany and France in 1940, the little, the three, the 10 tank divisions on the German side used their wireless and their victorious and the French tanks were not allowed to use their tanks or had no tanks at all and, lo and lost the war in three weeks. This event became famous and notorious and inspired the US tank armies to invent uh, for the Africa war the talkie walkie as a replacement of uh, UKW of FM senders, emitters, and receivers uh, inside uh, Guderian's tanks, tanks. Because Guderian was more brilliant than the world famous Rommel, let's put his name on the board. Guderian, as a young man, as a young officer, had led a uh, a wireless station in World War I. That's why he knew about uh, future things, things to come. The history of TV in, in Germany and in Britain took a bad end. Mm. Both uh, state-owned radio systems stopped their development of television on the, on the first day of the war, 1st September 1999, because uh, scientific development would have meant publication of the results, but uh, television monitors and radar monitors were almost identical, and they didn't want to give out their radar secrets and new and more most recent radar developments between to the enemy. The USA were not so deeply concerned from the European war, and so uh, TV development in the USA continued during the war with some impediments because RCA and all the other big companies were turned into uh, deliverers of, of war equipment. Radar by itself was invented before World War I by a Cologne-based engineer who, who, who liked to measure the distance between him and little ships, mercantile ships, on the river Rhine in Cologne. And this ship detection distance, this ship distance detection in World War II turned into uh, airplane detection from afar and turned into yeah, very it's a very Amusing story I have to tell because time gives me time. <laughs> My English friend, uh, Anthony Moore, the fifth Pink Floyd, as he calls himself sometimes, uh, told me that after some scientific research or historical research done by himself, uh, that, um, that uh, the English air defense against the Wehrmacht and the German 
Luftwaffe. Uh, experimented with two possibilities of how to detect uh, enemy aircraft at large before hearing and seeing him. And so, on the one hand, on the mechanical side, before they came down to radar, uh, they built big parabolic acoustic mirrors on the southern coast of England, where the enemy was supposed to enter the holy British ground. And in the, mid, in the precise middle of these uh, parabolic acoustic mirrors, just like uh, optical parabolic mirrors on the front of, of old-fashioned cars, uh, was put uh, a blind veteran of World War I on a little seat inside this vertically mounted parabole. And by this reflection and amplification of the, of the bomber's uh, roaring sound, the English hoped to detect these uh, German bombers for this in, by distance about 20 kilometers. It, 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 the, the parabolic mirrors still are there as, a, as military ruins in Kent and other country, uh, counties of England. And you can see them and you can take photographs and you can, and can remember the good old days of, <laughs> of war. <laughs> About radar, a, a radar chain covering southeast, uh, the English southeast coast proved much more efficient and the, its, its chief engineer or scientist, Watson Ward, was declared Sir Watson Ward by the king. This is the home chain, as it's, it's called since then. And radar, and, and now all what I have to say in, in, the, in the near future will be an ongoing history of miniaturization. Things, technical things become smaller and smaller and have to become so. The first radar stations in England and Germany were monsters. They are called a reason. One German name was Giant of the City, Würzburg, Würzburg Riese as high as a, as a big house and my, my half-brother lived inside one of these monsters and for years. And, but uh, the, the, the tactical, the tactical of Forderung, the tactical need that is a very urgent need, not strategic, but tactic need, was to miniaturize radar systems up to the point where they could be put inside a plane, inside a bomber or a fighter. Spitfire or Messerschmitt, what, what have you. Smaller tubes were needed and, and many, many things more and one dramatic uh, innovation. Electronics before World War II were freely soldered combinations of resistors, capacitors, uh, cables, copper cable, copper wire, and, and so on and so on. And inside a uh, high-speed plane, this very technical construction broke down and produced short circuits and, and little explosions, electrical uh, short cuts, short cuts, or, short, yeah. circuits. short circuits, and had to be replaced by what we call the, the printed circuit.
very origin of what later on became a transistor, a, a computer motherboard, for instance. That is, I, I shouldn't go into the, tech, the produ producer's details, but all these things were arrested on one plane, uh, plate and sold and, and very solid and not disturbed any, anymore by, by fight, by, by unfriendly fire and, and, and winds and, and so on. And finally, I learned from one of my students in his master's thesis that at the end of World War II, another step in, into this, our actual life has been done. Um, so many fightings, fighting planes were in the air that it became ne necessary to automatically distinguish between friend and foe. The pilots were overstressed and couldn't care for uh, Royal Air Force, Force or Luft, Luftwaffe and so on and so on. And so little systems, uh, uh, electronic uh, or radar, wireless radio systems were developed that uh, send waves. And in the case of a friendly neighbor, another English fighter, uh, this fighter answered, yes, I do. But automatically, not the pilot, but the so-called transponder. And in the case of no answer, it was clear this was a, 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 an enemy German fighter. And out of these transponders of World War II has come um, what is actually replacing the barcode in in warehouses and so on, radio frequency identification of of any of, of every given uh, underwear or or butter piece of butter or 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 car. The barcode was invented to organize or to 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 numerically represent a whole series of produce, product, productive things and the <coughs> Rafid will in the future identify every single female underwear to take my most romantic example. <laughs> if, I, if I buy my girlfriend someone sees uh, the number will stay forever with me as, as a consumer and I'm a detective in a criminalistic sense. But I forget to... I forgot to tell you the most important story. How? <coughs> no. I did it intentionally. I kept my secret uh, of World War II for tomorrow will be more surprising to await <laughs> the, <laughs> the arrival of the computer in the context of this war. And so I, my, my finish today will be moderate and, <coughs> and sweet and not so dramatic. Uh, but keep in mind this uh, massive German wireless traffic among tanks and airplanes and so on and so on and between tank divisions and the, uh, and, and the higher staffs in, in Berlin or uh, behind the front line and so on and so on. Please keep it in mind. And <coughs> I forgot to say that only high frequency um, FM radio, in German 
called in Germany called uh, UKW, Ultra Kurzwelle, uh, was able to individualize in the sense I just discussed, uh, so to say, every tank uh, battalion, so many different separated frequency were needed uh, to, in order to avoid jam, electrical jam in the air, uh, among these thousands, ten thousands of tanks and hundreds of tank divisions, that AM simply wouldn't have done it. Frequency had, as I said, regarding mobile telephones, frequencies have to go higher and higher in order to be more individualized in a sense which has nothing to do with the classical, philosophical, idealistical concept of the individual. And so I I moderate and will can, could be, for instance, the, the results of the war effort, as the Americans called it, mm. turned into civil commod uh, commercial commodities. And you, RCA and other US companies had time to develop their TV systems in direction of color TV systems and it was it came out in 47 I think NTSC the standard for for three color transmission of uh, TV signals and, and and but what it suffered from some some inborn uh, failures, and the Americans, as I read, misnamed NTSC uh, as never the same color. This color shift, especially cruel in human uh, visages, was uh, finally controlled by a French-German effort to give uh, more stable color signal, which had to do with this memorizing, the recording of television signals, and so makes a, a nice uh, transition to from electrics to electronics because, because electrics had no memory, and electronics is defined uh, of having memories in my sense. And the birth of the digital computer was uh, sensible as a necessity be just before and during World War II. Uh, the American war effort as regards physics and engineering was uh, di directed by Vannevar Bush, uh, MIT, and he disposed of the best American analog computer, and young Claude Shannon was his assistant in, 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 in pre this analog computer was, was tied of the ord ordnance office, uh, artillery trajectories, ballistic trajectories are not easy to uh, pre-compute pre pre uh, under real conditions of winds and changing winds and changing numbers and so on and so on. And that's why they needed computers and had only analog computers and no digital computers and solved the problem. The same happened in Germany. Uh, it's rather unknown or very little known that, um, that the development of the V2, famous first uh, liquid rocket, 
Das ist die große in Peenemünde und das ist das eine auf Usedom, wo es dann partly bei Analog Computing die Engine die Engineer responsible for this computer system in order to develop this rocket got a visit from Werner von Braun the German American hero and von Braun said our experimental rockets are trembling and shivering and falling down much too early and could you do some against uh, this sad effect I'll come back in six minutes in, in, sorry, in six, six months and ask you again whether or not you have found some solution and the responsible engineer answered no come back six or this very evening because they had a computer they can re reconfigure this computer they can yeah, all made up of, of tubes naturally and they can reconfigure it from division to multiplication from addition to subtraction and from combinations uh, it solved differential equations in a very uh, brutal for in, in a brute force way and in order to get some romantic real end mm, the problem of miniaturization of this algebra uh, post itself as well in, in the British Empire as in the case of the German Luftwaffe and Air, Air Force. Mm. When the rocket, the V2, really should hit London or Antwerp, in fact more rockets came down uh, over Antwerp than over London. This is for British ears, this is not easy to bear. Mm. The rocket had to know its own position on its way from Peenemünde or from, from Den Haag to Antwerp or London. And so the rocket had to measure its, its the way its history in the computer sense, the way it is passed, uh, what, what she had reached, arrived at, uh, under the conditions of vacuum, vacuum. No friction, no, no friction of, of air or no friction of the body, as in the case, case of cars, uh, gave any information uh, on the way the rocket had made. And so the engineers came to a rather genial solution. The only thing the rocket knew about itself was her acceleration. This could be measured in, any, in every second, you understand? You feel acceleration in a car, in a, in a plane, and inside the rocket, the rocket so, so, so to speak, felt its own acceleration. And acceleration uh, changes during the time of the, of the jet, the, the oxygen jet. And so the acceleration was a local and um, very changeable variable so it had to, had to be integrated to, in, in a strictly Newtonian way, the integral of acceleration, probably somebody of you knows it, is what? The integral? The integral of acceleration. Mass times force. Is? Mass times force. Mass times force. Now in, in the case of, uh, of movement, The, the integral of acceleration is simply speed. Oh. Oh, six six derivatives. Huh. Derivative. You have g. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I take the case of, of, the, conti of, of the continuing 
Earth uh, gravitation, e g, and not to, I, I don't take the changing acceleration of the rocket. speed over time is naturally the way, the, po the, po the position of the rocket at this very moment. Mm -hmm. Let's call it P position, P position. And so the V2 knew its position and could say French Luz. Uh, the rest of the story you will find in Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. Thanks again for listening. Thank you. Um, maybe you have some questions or you want to make some remarks or maybe someone of you wants to summarize his or her impressions or um, outcomes, learning outcomes, as it's called nowadays, mm -hmm. isn't it? <laughs> Maybe we're a little bit tired now, Tanya. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought, well, we could give people the chance to ask questions now, since we still have some time before we have to go to dinner. Six but minutes. They can wait any time. Six million. I'll ask a question. Yeah. It doesn't have to be answered tonight. Um, the whole trajectory of technological history that you've mapped out for us today, in your opinion, how how to what degree does it conform to models of technological determinism, hard or soft determinism, versus a narrative of like great man theory or some <laughs> other form of determinism? Oh, <laughs> 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 God. I'm against this kind of question. I, I won't decide them and, and I can't decide them. I see them technical deterministic part and I see some and, it's, and, it, and as you have well remarked I give a, a great part to innovative uh, scientists and engineers mm -hmm. and it's nothing in this history technical history and military history is necessitated in a strict Aristotelian sense I'd say or in a strict uh, Newtonian sense could we live with history as a mixtum com compositum made out of randomness and, and structures and goals and puzzles. Um, I, I see uh, I see that a little a, much, a little bit better answer would be uh, I don't like physical models of, of history I don't I, I like antagonistic bonds and that's why I told stories uh, between uh, northern and 
southern states in the civil war or uh, England against uh, Germany or, or German tanks against French tanks and the outcome depends on luck and as well as on as on ingeniosity, ingeniosity let's say it's I guess it's challenge as, as re and response as finally would have called it long long ago I guess also what I meant is the degree to which uh, uh, mankind's technological developments are inescapable in a way that we will do whatever there is to be done with the current um, understanding and tools. Um, but then I guess there are points in history where that's contradicted. Like I think of um, the uh, proto steam engine uh, from 100 AD, the Aleopile. Like a very early steam engine was, yeah. you know, in 100 AD, but it was never uh, capitalized upon until um, steam pumps. Uh, steam pumps? Steam engine. Watts. Watts steam engine. Yeah, here in Alexandria, yeah. You know, could have started the Industrial Revolution <laughs> 2,000 years earlier. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I guess that's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, but this is question. big question can't be given in, in, the, in the limits of three days. <laughs> <laughs> would be, a whole book would be needed. Exactly. Let's say the cultural backgrounds of the Greek were different from other, but also, hmm? you have another, another question. I'm wondering, like, in the, in, in the face of this procession of technology, what do you want the engineer to do? It's definitely a reoccurring element of your work. I mean, what, what advice would you give, or what suggestions, other than being highly technical? Like, what would you want? <laughs> take a revolver from time to time into his hands and to uh, march to the office of the management with the revolver and declaring the management that commercial aspects have, have to play the second role against engineering and aesthetic in uh, regards. Take the case of the early American color TV and DSC. It's, it was cool sound to see or take the case of conventional the television screens up to uh, the invention of the newest LED uh, monitors. It's, it's in the eyes of engineers or end users or in the eyes of engineers or uh, informed end users, it's sheer catastrophe. It's lousy as a standard. And what the engineer and no but the engineer or myself, uh, we can't do much uh, because billions of dollars or euros or so have already been invested into these standardized end products as television monitors or CD players or Bluetooth players and their replacement is a costly affair and the revolver doesn't Suffice, I fear. <laughs> <laughs> well, how? What would engineering be outside of a standing reserve of these objects? Uh, what would engineering be outside of a standing reserve of these objects? Like, what would that look like? Can you say something? How do you mean? It's a Heidegger in English. It doesn't translate perfectly very well. Um, uh, I mean, how would you? What would engineering be without this end product that was mass produced? I mean, would it be a work in progress? Would it be like a wiki object? I mean, what sort of product would you have? up to the engineers, <laughs> a genius to decide on the spot also. And, and
engineer. It's up to him to com or for her to combine engineering precision with some cultural idea or future to goal. Or visibility of the relationship he's working with. Because the miniaturization creates this mm. invisibility. And some, some uh, claim that the fact that the invisibility doesn't allow the user or the people in fact to what? understand the quality of what it's being made. Ah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm That's saying? Good, yeah. You know that was a, a big positive challenge to engineering uh, brilliance and not a hindrance for them. Mm -hmm. The Amer American engineering did a remarkable, remarkably long step or steep in, uh, during World, World War II and too few wars are not so good for engineering America. What I try to do uh, is to give, and, and sometimes I give public conferences even to engineers, uh, and I try to give them a little more knowledge of their past. In, in my, and my hope is that when the engineers learn more about their past, their future, they will, they will structure our future in a more conscious way or aesthetic way. Is it a yeah. I did this for VW, I did this for VW, for instance. Mm -hmm. I do that. Hmm? I do that. Or for 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 German uh, aerospace com company. Thank you for the questions.